Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, I'm Jason Buffington with Veeam. Uh, you'll notice that this week I am not joined by my normal colleague, Dave Russell. No, you're not. I am no, not Dave you're Russell. Not. <laughs> Dave Russell 2.0, at least as it comes to BCDR. Melissa, thank you for joining us this week. Thanks for having me, Jason. It's been a while. It has been a while. Now, for those of you that don't know, Melissa is our lead champion and powerhouse behind Orchestrator and all the technologies of actually how to improve real business continuity and disaster recovery uh, from Veeam. And so, Melissa, I want to kind of set up a, a problem scenario before we actually get into the data okay. for today's topic. Let's uh, let's go to the slides for just a second, because I want to kind of walk through for as long as you and I have been partnering around disaster recovery there's kind of three big goals that almost always come to do. So let me kind of build this out for the for the All folks right. at home. The first idea was, do you actually have survivable data, right? So do you have data someplace else that you could recover from when your primary production center is on fire, underwater, under earth, stolen, whatever Who the knows? case may be? Who knows? So we talk about that, survivable data. The next thing is, and of course, this is your love language, how do we shrink the time to recover any given workload, right? We're going to talk a little about orchestrator and some of the things that you've been doing around that. Um, and then lastly, but what if the primary infrastructure is gone? You're not putting it back where it came from. You're putting it back to a secondary site. You're putting it back to a alternative infrastructure or cloud or provider or something, but this is what every disaster looks like, fire, flood, earthquake, tornado, et cetera. When we talk about, and this is this is your battle cry, so I'm gonna have you weigh in after this, but when we talk about ransomware, right? Uh, ransomware is a disaster. There's a few extra steps that we have to talk through. Walk us through these pivots, and then let's talk about what the data says about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen a lot of people just getting really scared out there when they're thinking about, okay, I know I'm going to get hit by ransomware at one point. What on earth do I do to recover? Well, you start with your disaster recovery plan, which I hope is up to date and tested, but we'll talk about that in a little while. But a couple things change when it comes to a ransomware attack. Uh, first of all, we have to determine the sprawl, right? How much was impacted? I mean, if I lost a storage array, I know that everything on that storage array is poof and I need to recover it, right? In the event of a ransomware attack, it might not be immediately evident uh, how much of my environment was compromised. So that becomes a really important thing to consider how much was impacted. Next is survivable repositories. Are there any copies left? We know these threat actors are out there and they wanna make sure you can't recover, right? They want to make sure you pay that ransom. So they're going to try to go after the copies of your data to get rid of them. So we need to make sure that we have copies in a state that they cannot do that. And we need to assess after a ransom attack, what do we have left, right? And then last but certainly not least, okay, we have data. Uh, is it clean, right? How do we restore this in a fashion that we're just not reintroducing this threat over and over again, right? So we kind of take our regular disaster recovery steps and we add a little bit to them so that we can kind of you know prepare for this slightly more unique disaster and i don't know if unique is the right word actually you know what it is because every ransomware attack is different right you don't All know right. what exactly is going to happen until it happens you might be planning for one thing and say hey i'm going to recover to my dr site but guess what they got in that too so you got to go to the cloud uh so you kind of don't know how it's going to unravel until it unravels Sure, sure, sure. So speaking of the breadth of kinds of disasters and the kinds of ransomware attacks that are out there, we probably have a breadth of attendees uh, on today's <laughs> session. And we'd like to hear from uh, where you are. So uh, our goal always is to turn the world beam green. Absolutely. Um, I am down in the great state of Texas. Um, uh, uh, usually Dave Russell is in the state of Colorado, uh, but this week we're going to give, and I think he's dialed in, which is why we still get to flag him green. Uh, <laughs> you are up in, uh, up in, uh, the New Jersey uh, I am, area. Yes. Um, we've got uh, Felicia doing social media out of Ohio. Um, our producer is out of Georgia. Uh, and our goal, please pile on, where are you from? And also, by the way, just for the record, um, please play this back. Um, you have never met someone as strong in BCDR as Melissa Palmer. So if you have questions about disaster recovery and orchestrating, um, uh, put those into the chat as well. This Absolutely. is a great opportunity to pick her brain. So 
Um, let's break down some of the data that's there um, Ooh, that we did in the special part. report. This is my this favorite, is my part. favorite part. Data, I, I love data. Me too. So uh, earlier this year, we did a report called the Data Protection Trends Report, largest report of its kind, nearly 3,400 respondents in that data set. And we saw the high frequency of folks that were getting hit by ransomware. So we doubled down and we asked another thousand organizations who had been hit by ransomware in 2021. And we asked them, you know, all kinds of things about were they prepared, how bad was the attack uh, along that way. Here's one of the things I think was most interesting is when organizations were asked, are they ready, right? And how do you know that you're ready for anything? You test. So I want to get your reaction to this, and then let's kind of uh, uh, nerd on it for a minute. Okay, so uh, we're, we got 60% of people checking that they're confirming successful backups. So that is better than nothing, but that should be 100, I'm sorry. Like if your backups aren't working, you've missed the boat. Um, if you like that data, you should have backed it up because you can't recover something from ransomware unless you've protected it first. So 60% of you, good job. 40% of you, go check your backups right now, we'll wait. Uh, scripted test resource <laughs> of data files for readability or, or of media storage, that's good. That's also very good. So we've got 44% of people actually testing if these backups actually work, right? So that that's kind of okay, maybe. Okay, maybe. so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna poke fun at, at these for a second because you're actually a much, you know what it is? You're an hour ahead of me, so you probably have had more coffee, but I'm gonna be the pessimist on this for a second because when the backup logs come back, and Dave Russell and I have poked fun at this already, you know what the backup logs basically say is the job ran. Yeah. One of the I more mean, interesting scenarios that I've heard. Yeah. One of the more interesting scenarios that I've heard about, though, is when the bad actor actually gets into compromised credentials and changes the backup job. So you're simply removing from the job mm -hmm. protected workload. So now the job is green, right? It just so it. happens that <laughs> nothing actually got backed up, right? Um, I'm also going to poke fun at the scripted. Um, that middle option is basically what we used to call read after write. Yeah. So I wrote to a tape and then I read from the tape to make sure the same data came back. CRC, there's no corruption. And that was fantastic 25 years ago <laughs> when tape didn't read well, right? You know, you wrote it to a tape, the buffer crapped out, and all of a sudden you couldn't read from that tape. Yeah. Today's modern uh, uh, LTO cartridge is more reliable against bit rot than whatever spindle that you want to put on on a drive today. So that ain't I, I would I would technically call you that both of those are almost as red as the four percent of organizations that said, nah, we, we don't, don't do test. Anything. We're good. Oh, All right. We're so gonna, can we please talk fingers. about the 16 percent that got okay, it right? So 16 percent of you out there, congratulations, you have it right. You're actually testing if these VMs work or not. Right. You're doing a full restore. You're restoring it and you're checking if the application works as expected. And that is what we need to do to be able to prove without a doubt that we can recover from a ransomware attack. I hear lots of cases of people even paying the ransom because they're like, well, we think we can recover, but it's going to take too long. We don't think we can do it in time, right? We got to get everything back. And that's just a whole different thing. You shouldn't do that either. So the only way to truly prove that you are able to recover from a ransomware attack is to do a full restore. And now is the time to do that. Because if you find bottlenecks in your vSphere environment or something doesn't work right, or it just blows up in your face, at least now you know, so you have the time now to fix things before disaster day comes. I, I gotta give props to Steve Merriman, um, who said the tape ejected. That means the backup worked, right? Um, <laughs> If we had more than a half an hour, I will tell you about a story where I actually forgot to set up a job that would actually rotate the tapes. And so an admin that I had trained, every week the backup ran on the same tape for six concurrent months. They pulled the tape out of the drive. All the magnetic dust was gone. All that was left was the clean cellophane. It was the worst thing ever. Anyway, uh, but yes, props to Steve for um, for keeping this light this morning. Yeah, it, it, these are flaws, right? So if you're not actually testing, did the app come back up? Um, so 16% actually do that, right? Can you can the app actually power up? If you're not in that 16%, that means five out of six. Candidly, and there's a lot of, hey, different ways for different people. No, this is just wrong. <laughs> if you if you can't test the app went up, you, you're not actually testing. Um, 
let's go on to our, our second big thing. And while we're doing that, I'm going to look and check and see if the map's going uh, and how that's going. But let me walk through. We said there's a couple pieces to this puzzle. The first one is, are you testing and validating? The second one is, and this comes back to something I know is near and dear to your heart. Yes. We yes. ask organizations, how do we shrink that down? Now, Melissa, and I've used this, this, uh, uh, this analogy before. I just got back from another scout camp no surprise um, this last week, you know, when we teach the first aid merit badge um, to scouts. One of the things we specifically talk about is how do you shrink the time between snake bite and hospital, right? Because that, that defines your probability of success, shrinking the time between snake bite and hospital. We talk about it. How do we shrink that time? And to first do that, we have to figure out what is the mechanism that you're using for failover. I'm gonna ask you to start at 12 o'clock, work your way around on what do you see on this chart? Oh dear, we will manually reconfigure user connectivity during the crisis. 29% of respondents think that they're gonna get hit by ransomware. They're gonna manually recover everything and they're gonna be successful. And I don't know how to tell the 29% of you out there that you're gonna have a really bad time. It's not going to go well for you. Melissa, two of those three things are correct. Um, they're going to discover the outage. They're going to manually reconfigure and they're <laughs> going to be successful. Two out of three of those statements are accurate. The other one is bless their hearts. <laughs> yes. And then then we're getting like a little a little better. Right. We have predefined scripts for reconnecting resources that are now running remotely. That's a little better. I hope your scripts are up to date. And once of all, I've hoped you've tested them, um, especially if new workloads have come onto an application, right? Like one of the great things about VMware is it's so easy to add capacity. Oh, you know, we're in the wall, deploy 10 more application servers. Well, if you never put those 10 application servers in the script, you might not be able to <laughs> work there, right? So that that is better than doing it manually, but there is still a lot of overhead in there, making sure that everything is kept up to date on a regular basis. So I would give you what, like a C, Jason? Would we give them like a C? Yeah, but but the thing is, I mean, if you look at how this data lays out, so so basically <sighs> collecting these together, three out of four organizations, there's a couple of things that are wrong with this process. One, it's nearly an all manual process. Yeah. And two, and I'm just going to point this out for the kids at home, it presumes that the subject matter expert is part of the recovery process. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, because you're expecting mm -hmm. that someone who's actually knowledgeable is going to reconfigure or someone who's actually knowledgeable is going to invoke and adapt those scripts on the fly. One of the things that real disasters have taught us for years is that in most cases, the original admins are not available. Now, it's not always a catastrophic uh, loss of life event, but often it's not available. Right. Um, floods, fire geographic problems, power. There's lots of reasons why the subject matter experts aren't available, which means three out of four of these plans is not gonna play, fail. Now, before we get to the fun part of this, let's take a break for a second. I do wanna kind of pull up the map because these answers are all over the map. Let's see wow. where the respondents are as well. See what I did there? A we got a lot of all right, on. so let's take a look first in the United States uh, or North America. So we got uh, Pennsylvania. It's been a while since we've seen them. New Hampshire's in the house. Uh, uh, New York, your neighbors. Um, so good for that. Uh, Kentucky, uh, home of my favorite uh, whiskeys and bourbons. State of Washington, state of California. Um, and uh, my neighbors to the south uh, in uh, in Mexico wow, all that's, reporting that's in. That's so. looking mighty green today. That's pretty Mighty, cool. mighty green. Um, still looking for some Latams and some Canadians to really hit that new hemisphere. But it's a good start. Speaking of green, got Ireland in the house. Um, always a pleasure there. Uh, Germany's in. Uh, Dabut, our friends from Italy, are there as well. What do we got else? We got Nigeria. It's been a while since I've been on for uh, with Nigeria, so that's awesome. And then I, I think that's Pakistan in the upper right-hand corner. So uh, so thank you also for joining as well. So yeah, let's turn the world green. There's, uh, there's a couple big chunks that haven't weighed in yet, but I'm hoping that they will um, in short order. And uh, and uh, yeah, Cornell, yeah, snake bite to hospital, right? That's how we fix this. So let's go back to that chart because, as we said, okay, three yeah, out of four back. organizations have gotten it wrong. So let's take a look at how do you shrink that time. And this is like we're just, we're just like giving away the secrets, right? We're telling you exactly what yeah. you need to do. 
Break it uh, down we, for us, Melissa. Okay, I can't actually read this. We have orchestrated workflows that will reconnect resources that are now running remotely, right? So you don't have to do anything, right? It's just gonna work. You're gonna say, I need to run that workflow. You're gonna run that workflow and it will automatically do everything for you. You are good to go. And if you're using something like Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator, you can test that and it will tell you exactly how long it will take. So when ransomware day comes and they're like, give us all the Bitcoins or whatever, you can say, I can have you up and running in eight hours. Let's just let's just go, right? So I, I wanna talk about the power of workflows for a second. So one of the things that's really important for folks to understand is, is that humans are really bad at minutia. They are. They are even worse, minutia um, repetitively. Under pressure. Can we add under pressure to that too? I was going with that. Worse and then worse still. So in a good, better, best. So now think about this. I am under pressure doing repetitive minutia tasks with my boss's boss's boss standing over my shoulder waiting for things to turn back on again, right? Humans are not built for that. You know what is? Computers. Computers are built for that, right? So in this case, an orchestrated workflow. The other thing I really love about workflows that I don't think enough folks understand is when you think about those manual scripts, when you think about manually reconfiguring, what often IT pros will do is they'll say like, oh, I'm not really going to move the uh, the storage volume over because I know that's going to work. So I'll just <laughs> test the other pieces, right? Or yeah, I know once the server comes up, um, it's probably going to, uh, it'll, it'll come back online because the primary um, instance of it works just fine when I rebooted, oh, except that I forgot about that whole DHCP thing and I eh, actually put a static whatever. address, right? Right, so so the fact that, that often when we test, we cut a couple corners because we've made a couple assumptions, right? The best part about orchestrated workflows is not just shrinking snake bite to hospital, but actually knowing that you're gonna use the same recipe and the same clicks and the same steps each and every time while you test. So that's the time to figure out where those holes in your plans are. And you can't do that if it's manual. You just can't. No, you can't. So, um, so all right. So that's the that's the second of the three elements that we see from um from leveraging orchestration as part of that uh is is the is the failover mechanisms along the way. I'm gonna bring up the third part though, because you've mentioned testing a few times along I the way. Have. So, so this is actually a new slide. Um, this one actually had fallen out of our earlier series from the Data Protection Trends Report. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even though it's not part of the ransomware project, I wanted to bring it up because, Melissa, actually, you authored this I question did. in the DPR survey. So you need to be the one to unpack this. Now, let me tell you what we actually did here. So in the, um, so in the 30, uh, of the 3,400... IT executives around 28 countries around the world that did this survey, about 1,800 of them said they were knowledgeable about their organization's BCR strategy. That's why the N is 1,800, which by the way is still 6X what you would typically see in a normal research project. On the right-hand side, we asked them three different questions during the survey. How often do you update your documentation? That's the brightest green on the uh, left. Yeah. Then how often do you test a single workload, which we've already talked about, right? That's that middle column, single failover. And then we asked, how often do you test multiple workloads or a site level failure and recovery? And that's that darkest column on the right. And what I noticed when we got the data back was plus or minus a couple percent. It sounds like or in, I'm gonna infer that most organizations are actually doing all of these activities on the same relative cadence, right? There's only a few points of disparity between each of the columns. So we went ahead and averaged it out and that's the pie chart. Let's just talk to that pie chart for a little while. There's some good news, Melissa. One in five organizations <laughs> are updating their, their, um, their BCDR documentation and testing monthly and i love that that is only good news if you are one of those five though yay for you okay right so right. one in five uh you're testing and you're updating your dr docs monthly that's a pretty good place to be that's um, a fantastic place to be re realistically you people. can get way more aggressive than that but monthly i'm like happy when i see that i, I can live with that um but then we start talking about two months three months all right, okay, okay, hey, my coffee's kicking in, so let me be optimistic okay, for a right, second. Right. Because if you right. add the monthlies 
and the bi-monthlies. That's another 17%. And I'm going to even add in the the every three months because that I know still you're means gonna, you can... I know you're going to, but that has me a little, mm, but I'll okay, let you okay, go. Okay, I'll okay, let you okay, go. But, but okay. quarterly, but quarterly, half organizations are quarterly or better. Right. You got to give them at least a silver will, star, will, maybe not okay, gold. I'll, silver. We'll give them silver because right. that's a good place to be. But think of the change that can happen in a quarter with an application or with your data. That could be a significant change um and you know the big thing i'm considered here i'm concerned with here is not like your backups and how old your data is it's that you're missing stuff in your plan right that right. new application came online or you made significant changes or you add or you even removed right that's what i'm worried about here the changes you might have made in that quarter uh so it's something to stay on top of and hopefully as part of your change management process you are changing and updating those dr plans right i hope so um Probably not, but I'm, I'm going to hope. I'm going to hope today, yeah. Jason. So the thing that breaks my heart, though, right? So I'm I was the optimist, right? So you were. so you were. rough of half of all organizations, roughly quarterly, only twenty one percent, only one in five get a gold star, right? Yeah. Um, uh, a half of them are doing quarterly, which is better than it has been a couple years ago. That's true. We have seen improvement. And so now we start scrolling over that left hand. Can we talk side, about but... the other half though? Yeah. Okay. Let's let's talk about that. So so even the four and five months, I'm going to say, hey, it's better than it used to be. Okay. Ain't okay. where it's supposed okay. to be, but better no. than it used to be. Okay. And then we get into the status quo, the norm that we're all deviating from and hopefully improving from. And then we got 14% of that six month range, another nine percent that calls it 23% uh, total. Uh, plus four is 27, plus one is 20. For 28 mm. percent of organizations, mm -hmm. one in four ish, mm -hmm. six months or greater. This is what um, our friend uh, uh, Kirsten Snover calls a resume generating event. Yes. Right. So you're not coming back from this. Can you please explain to the kids at home why you're not coming back? Uh, your your stuff is just too old. Right. You're going to lose way too much stuff. You're going to miss too many things. Uh, you're going to be in trouble. But here's the thing, right? Uh, you're looking at, OK, I test every six months. Fine, whatever. Why don't you test more often? Let's figure it out, right? Is it a people thing? Is it a resources issue? Is it a timing thing? Is every too busy? Is everybody too busy? Because that's when solutions like orchestration and automation start to make a little sense, right? Because I can tell you right now with Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator, I can roll up, click the button, roll a DR test whenever I want, but I can schedule it. I can schedule it to happen weekly if I want to, and it has no impact to production. And the orchestrator will also update my documentation and catch all those changes for me. So when you talk about looking at the risk that you're introducing by not testing more than every six months, now, again, now is the time to look at things that you can do to improve like automation and orchestration before the disaster strikes, because now you have the time. Now you have the time to sit there and make sure everything's backed up, make sure your plans are uh, up to date, make sure you're testing them. And take it to the next level, right? At least you're testing every six months. I'll give you a bronze medal for that because it's better than nothing, right? But now's the time to focus and just amp it up, right? So you know that you're ready to recover when something happens. Not if, because it's a when. You've been lucky so far if it hasn't happened. So let me, let me be honest for a second and just acknowledge for the folks at home. When we talk about doing things like updating documentation, that is not a very sexy activity in IT, right? So there's not a whole lot of value creation that comes out of that other than being better prepared, right? Um, when we talk about testing, testing is hard, right? Testing in an unobtrusive way where hard. you're not impacting the production environment is hard because you got to create a new network framework for it. And then you got to bring the, you got to convert the backup so that connects to the, to the sandbox. Then you got to bring it up and then someone's got to go and test, did the app work? Those are all hard steps if you're doing them manually, right? And so I respect the fact that for most organizations, they're doing it every six or 12 months because for most of you them, they were having to declare right? disaster. It's a significant- uh, And go to your provider. Exactly. Yeah. It's a significant effort to even do it every six months or a year, which, again, is better than nothing. But when you add automation and orchestration, is it some upfront work now? I, I don't think, honestly, I don't think it's any worse than running a DR test, having it fail and fixing all this stuff. You're better off right. just putting the orchestration automation solution in at that point. So a couple of years ago, right before I joined Veeam, one of my last research projects when I was an analyst was I was asking the same question, right, or, or a similar version to it. And the question was, you know, how often do you test? Um, fun, fun fact, when an organization was using a third party 
um, hot sites. So SunGuard, IBM, mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah, Comdisco, those, those yeah. kinds of folks. The average was every nine months. You know, it was about an sp- even split between the six-monthers and the 12-monthers, and that was the best you got, right? When you were um, uh, testing and you had more than one data center that you managed all the management framework in between, right, which is going to bring us back to mm-hmm. VMware and vCenter and Orchestrate and those kind of things, folks were testing on the reg- on, on the neighborhood of once every three to four months. When they added an orchestration framework, they tested on average once every five weeks. And the only difference between those three maths is that you've removed the human from the minutia and, and the, the, the tasks, right? Get them out of the way. It sounds kind of Skynet-ish if you're a Terminator fan, but again, just get the human out of the way because then those computers are really good at repetitive tasks. It's literally, it's originally why we built them was competitive minutia computing tasks. And today, that's still the better way to do that. If you take away nothing else, think about how you can orchestrate all of your disasters, right? Yes. The fire, the flood, the tornado, the all hurricane. Oh, by the way, and then remember, the ransomware is a disaster. So, all right, um, let's do this. We're coming close on time. We can throw the map up really quick, but actually it's been pretty light this morning, Melissa. So we got Massachusetts. I guess uh, everybody's too busy automating their disaster recovery plans to watch, right? They saw us kind of say that you better back that up. You better make sure your backups run and test it. Everybody ran and is doing a DR test right now. Um, if you are, we'd like to see screenshots. Yes, please. your Facebook feed and your, uh, and your LinkedIn. Let us know your RPO and on. RTO you achieved. There you go. Uh, yeah, so over in uh, over in the the new world in the Americas, I saw Massachusetts is weighed in that upper right hand corner. Um, if we go and take a look at, uh, let's go back to Europe for a second. Looks like Belgium's in the house, right? And then uh, and then lastly, I think we got uh, Cambodia over in that right hand corner. So haven't seen them in a while. So we got a couple things we want to kind of plug folks on. Um, so yeah. let's see. So this. Friday, the 22nd, noon, our normal East Coast uh, uh, U.S. time zone. we got big changes coming in Microsoft Teams. And so, Melissa, two of your colleagues, uh, Kirsten yes. and Corinne, are going to be talking about that. Right? Um, and, and again, if, if you are not protecting your 365 environment, including Teams. We need to talk. We need to talk more. Um, yeah, figure that out between now and then Friday and then look for what's going to come you, next for worry. that. Uh, next Monday, same bat time, same uh, bat channel, East Coast, 12 o'clock. Uh, so this time next week, um, neither of us are going to be on, but Dave Russell, um, is joining Brad Lynch and we're going to talk about survival repositories, right? We talked about that as one That's of the key. steps. Uh, and Melissa, all that orchestration you talked about that works mm-hmm. with survival oh, yeah, repositories, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yes. All right. And then, and then mark your calendars on this one because this one's actually really interesting. So a week from Friday, so write this down right now, July 29th. So, uh, so Rick um, is uh, uh, Rick Vanover, our uh, our beloved colleague. Um, he's talking about the 23rd annual Sys Admin Day, and he's going to be greeted by uh, Saggy Brody um, from the Veeam community, and we're going to talk about some of those the goods, the bads, the uglies, the how did I ever do that in the past stuff around sysadmin stories. So that's going to be a lot of fun, um, but it does come an hour early because Saggy wakes up a little uh, later than the rest of us or later time zone earlier. Anyway, uh, him and Rick are going to nerd out um, a week from uh, week from Friday on the 29th. So please join us for that. Uh, and then also I'm going to give a plug for, um, if you haven't, um, let's show the screen one more time. We did a really fast track of a lot of different things, but if you really want to see um, some of Melissa's insights, uh, I got a chance to sit down with her late last year, and we had a session called The Nine Keys to Better Business Continuity and Disaster Recovery. We talked about documentation. We talked about alignment across the organization. We talked about testing and mechanics and minutia. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and drop in the uh, um, in the chats the link for that on-demand webinar. If you really want to get inside of Melissa's head um, in 59 minutes or less, this is definitely the webinar to join. Melissa, it's the bottom of the hour. It um, is. Uh, this has been fantastic. Um, always love to spend time with you. Um, and so thanks for joining the live stream today. Thanks for having me, Jason. All right. On behalf of Veeam, thanks for watching. Have a great week.